kind of stuff. Morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out first thing on day two of the conference. Special thanks to Kelly for scheduling us first thing day two of the conference. <laughs> uh, time is tight, so intros will be short. I'm Craig, that's Sarah. Since 2019, we've been co-directors of the Legal Information Institute at Cornell Law School. That's Tim Stanley. He's the founder and CEO of Justia. If you think you don't know or don't like LII, that's fine. We're used to it. You're in good company with, say, the faculty of Cornell Law School. <laughs> just, just, just kidding, sort of. Uh, if you think you don't know or don't like Justia, you should evaluate your life choices, seriously. Um, what we're going to talk about today are some of the challenges that we encounter in our work in free law and uh, that we've identified as as being as impacting the availability or the quality of the legal data that AI systems can and should ingest. So, with that in mind, Sarah's going to go first, and I'll be back up here. And Tim, who's you all come to see, we'll, we'll go last, so you don't all leave if he goes first. Um, Sarah, please. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so I'm going to preface this by saying that I cannot begin to scratch the surface of how many ways the inconsistencies in data availability, data formats, and data integration pose uh, challenges for makers of legal information systems and uh, for those who rely on them, whether directly or on behalf of their clients. Now, if you didn't skip class yesterday, you're well, well aware that generative AI offerings are based on a combination of training over very large textual corpora, reinforcement learning from human feedback, and, and I think this was a little bit underemphasized, but I'll go out on a limb, limb here, a wide assortment of techniques for values alignment. Um, Quick remediation in response to bad press around undesirable generated text output demonstrates rapid adaptation, at least on the corporate level, um, but also shows how quickly moving on target these systems present. My focus here um, is on the challenges we face to textualize, standardize, and formalize legal data. Um, and, and I'll wrap up with a little bit about where we're, where we're going from here. Um, I'm going to quote from principal analyst and director of the Systems Analysis and Quality Assurance Team for, and this is a mouthful, the Office of the Clerk in the United States House of Representatives, um, who frequently notes the following aspirations for government data. Government data should be accessible, it should be accurate, complete, described, it should be free, machine readable, permanent, searchable, timely, and usable. It's a tall order. But combined with the work of the government publishing office during the last many years to earn and maintain an ISO 16363 trustworthy digital repository certification for GovInfo, it means that the federal government has both the aspirations and the infrastructure to contemplate hosting a comprehensive authoritative collection, at least of federal law. Now we're not we're not there yet. Um, GovInfo, for example, has a collection of federal case law moving day forward, uh, but that collection consists of slip opinions in PDF format, without permanent citations. Um, now, I'm in a room populated by a lot of law librarians and a lot of legal data experts, uh, so I, I, I don't want to belabor this, but we, we do have a, a new programmer, and I'll, I'll say that explaining that it takes many years before an official text of a U.S. Supreme Court decision with a permanent citation becomes available is, in fact, a bit of a hike. Now, it's worth noting that governments do take a variety of approaches to providing access to their legal information, including contracting with commercial publishers to provide access that is free but not open, and including making use of platforms that impede automated exploration and extraction of the underlying text, whether via terms of use or via technical means. Uh, 
During the last few years, we have been working on a, a large collection of regulations of the 50 states of the United States, and out there in the world are many state websites that contain these regulations. Um, Massachusetts is beautiful. It's published in a way that is easily usable, accessible, reliable, um, and uh, published by the state itself. Um, Vermont uh, has a, a collection of state regulations that is, is published on a, on a, a LexisNexis platform. Um, and then California has a collection of regulations that is, is published by Westlaw. Um, and in addition to that wrinkle um, and the inconsistency in what the platform is, what the, what the data format is, what the access is, um, and I, I will mention that Craig will talk about this, but there are examples of cumbersome and very expensive barriers that can arise when the context, uh, the content of a document is, is not published directly, but is instead incorporated by reference. And so the go-to example of this is that as a user, you can be on the Westlaw platform for state regulations in California, but if you want to read the building code, they send you to a landing page on the state of California's website, which in turn sends you to an order form where you can buy a copy of the, of the building code. So it's far from open and, and far from free. Um, beyond that, there and barriers to crawling, there are a wide variety of formats in which legal text and documents are, are published. Uh, there are legal documents that are published as images. Um, legal documents that are published as PDFs, um, whether mixed content, readily accessible text, text with XML, um, or, or some combination of the above. Uh, the, the documents can have differences in formatting. Uh, they can reflect differences in notation that are holdovers from print publishing. Um, at a time when space on a page was very expensive, and so there would be data tables that would contain um, the, the letters D, O, and a dot um, to indicate that the field was populated by the same value as the previous field, um, and so on and so forth. Um, when ingested by a comparatively naive crawler or application or uh, it, as training data for a large language model, this can, this can create some, um, some unexpected inconsistencies. A couple of examples. <laughs> this is actually the otherwise extremely beautiful, usable, machine-readable ECFR that is published uh, at ecfr.gov. As it happens, the, the appendix um, uh, to Part 27, which is a list of chemicals in, of interest to um, the Department of Homeland Security, is published as a bunch of images. Um, it, it seems pretty clear that this is a holdover uh, from a time when those uh, tables were published on printed pages and they only fit in one direction. Um, when we were first uh, engaging in a comprehensive web accessibility compliance initiative, um, our amazing collaborator, law librarian Char Charlotte Schneider, made a video exclaiming that our tables rotated so your head didn't have to. Um, and uh, over time, with, with some help and notably from public.resource.org, we were able to convert these features into semantically marked up HTML. But this was cumbersome, time consuming. It was a manual task. Um, and between uh, where we started and what could possibly be ingested and made heads or heels of, uh, we suspect that there's a little bit more um, than uh, might meet the eye. Um, another challenge um, that we face is that the text of legal corpora and particularly statutes and regulations and compilations and codifications um, they tend to accrete in ways that make reading them not tremendously intuitive. Um, this is an example we've been trotting out for years and years. I think everyone in this room knows that the flag of the United States of America has four, not 48 stars, but rather 50. Um, and if you read the notes to uh, 4 USC section one, and if you read the next section entitled same additional stars, uh, you can, you can 
get the documentation of, the, of this fact. Um, now, that probably seems trivial, because <coughs> we all know it. Um, and in, in fact, if you're training a large language model, you probably have enough examples from outside the law to, um, to establish that this is the right answer is the right answer. Um, but it's an example of a phenomenon of indirection that is detrimental to cohesion and understanding. Um, so in the era of print, a lot of work went into making information cohere by manually annotating, extracting information, and creating finding aids. Um, and so we have these print artifacts that include a lot of formatting and notation, some of which puts the information in adequate proximity, um, some of which maybe doesn't, um, some of which contains some, some formatting that we might want to make use of. Um, and so when we start to ask the question, okay, how close are we from our text over here to our text over there, and how do we make sure that everything that needs to know about everything else actually does know about it, everything else, we start to ask questions about um, <coughs> matters like, is the granularity correct? Is, the, is, a, is a model going to understand the containing relationship between a part and a section? Um, and uh, and is, is there, are the section ranges going to work, or are we going to only get section 1823 and section 1825, and maybe it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't understand that there's a range. Um, there are a lot of moving targets for some of these. Uh, we, over time, have digitized a lot of resources and um, found that, uh, that all the work that goes into digitizing teaches us something, and then the, the resource changes, and it's structured in a completely different way. The tendency is to flatten the information space, um, and so containing concepts that are um, that are helpful for getting a big picture organization sometimes tend to go away. Um, and then we have situations in which the, the text itself can, um, although it's, it's published in an official publication, um, can be mistaken. Um, and there, um, there was an example. We are very fortunate to have talented Masters of Engineering students who collaborate with us on, on their research projects. And this semester, everyone was interested in trying out what was, what was in the headlines. Um, and so I, I thought I'd, I'd take it for a test drive first before I, before I handed it over and suggested that they, that they go full steam ahead. Uh, and I, I found this section. Um, we, they were trying to extract definitions. And we have this text, and, and I asked ChatGPT, okay, um, uh, how do we, how do we, uh, how is average final compensation defined? Um, and so it gives, it gives a citation, um, and uh, I realize, okay, I don't, I don't really know RCW um, because those are that's on the that's on the statute side. We're working on the regulation side, and so I went and looked, and I realized, well, it's it, that's actually. That's actually not right. Uh, it's, it's section six, um, and then I turned around and realized that um, that in fact it was the regulation that was that that contained an error, uh, whether it was by uh, being out of date or uh, just misdrafted to, to begin with. Um, and so it's. Uh, it's not an example that, that, that seems tremendously important, but it, it uh, I think, was an occasion on which I realized, well, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're not gonna solve all of our problems um, by just having smarter and smarter engines um, working, on, um, working on source data that, uh, that contains errors. Uh, we're, we're still going to have to, um, we're still going to have to Make use of all of the quality assurance approaches and techniques that uh, that we have been um, uh, chipping away at year year in and year out, uh, and um, this is this is made more complicated uh, because 
we came to be aware that, it, thanks to uh, Bob Mboji's article in, in the Washington Post, that a lot of the training data that went into the models um, came from uh, pub publications of large uh, corpora of, of legal data from Justia, um, a little bit from us as well. Uh, and so we were going to face also a tendency to get back results that were a little bit, um, a little bit more likely to be an average of all of the examples uh, that had been in the, in the corpus um, and a little bit less likely even if we turned the temperature way down to be um, uh, the exact item that we were looking for. Um, and so we have one, <laughs> One last example, um, which is uh, something that for years um, was uh, really a, a thorn in our side, uh, which is that um, earlier I was, I was mentioning the 48 stars and the flag, and, and, and we all get a laugh from time to time when people write in about that and, and, and call us clowns. Um, but this is far more important. Um, this is the, the definition of marriage and spouse um, until a couple months ago, uh, in the U.S. Code, if you went there, you would you would see this merit, definition of marriage and spouse that the U.S. Supreme Court had determined was unconstitutional. And if you looked, there was a tiny editorial note that indicated that you could go and read the U.S. Constitution annotated by the Congressional Research Service and look at the appendix and see um, a, a, a reference to this in a um, a list of acts of Congress held unconstitutional in whole or in part by the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, there are many examples um, of legal language that is um, hopefully mostly in the past um, that, is, that is far more damaging um, and, and potentially, um, potentially unhappy uh, for uh, people to have represented as being the law. Um, and we hope that before anyone has a chance to notice um, uh, what a chatbot will pair it, uh, there will be some consideration of, of these data sources. Um, so we're keeping focus on having an authoritative, comprehensive um, legal corpus and uh, working on the data models that are going to make it possible for that to be used uh, appropriately uh, and, and successfully. And now I'll turn it over That's to Craig. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. I put my glasses on so no one's serious. Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk about how copyright claims potentially imperil the data sets on which large language models feed and thus the completeness of the models themselves as well as the quality of their outputs in a legal services context. I want to mention I'm going to be taking what's an unusual step for me at least of sticking pretty closely to a script but that's only because of the time limit and my tendency to ramble otherwise. But uh, I'll be using these five cases to, on this slide here today to uh, frame my thoughts. If my citation formats aren't technically correct, by all means, feel free to leave me off your school's law review. <laughs> all right, uh, let's start with Georgia v. Piero. Uh, three years ago, the free law community in general and Carl, Ma Carl Malamud's organization, Piero in specific, won a major victory in the courts. In that case, the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately held that annotations to the Georgia Code prepared by LexisNexis under a contract commissioned by the state legislature and then adopted by Legislative Act as the official code of Georgia annotated could not be copyrighted under something that's called the Government Edicts Doctrine. In short, the court said that a state legislature like judges cannot be authors under the copyright statute and the role of the Georgia legislature in first commissioning and then adopting the annotations created by a third party were sufficient to invoke the Government Edicts Doctrine. Well, I argued at the time, and I still believe to this day, that that holding was fairly narrow insofar as it relied on the specifics of how Georgia had done its business in arriving at that official code annotated. Chief Justice Roberts did say many, many good things for the free law community in the dicta of the majority opinion. Today, I've got just one on my slide, which I won't read aloud, but in short, the takeaway from the emphasis added stuff at the end there is the copyright is presumptive and adheres automatically, right? And so therefore, if every time someone wants to share the law, they have to first violate a copyright and then defend their actions as fair use, that is, in the words of the court, 
notoriously fact sensitive. So the court understands that a fair use defense, especially in a case about our ability to communicate about the law, is messy and inefficient and kind of a last resort. You're here. So back to my first slide, these three very similar cases in the red box are now among the forefront of copyright and the law, but they speak to a slightly different scenario than the one in Georgia v. PRO, in which the courts in D.C. and New York and California so far have all agreed falls outside of the government edicts doctrine. In each of these, there are private organizations that have created industry standards or model codes and copyrighted them, and then governments, up to and including the federal government, have adopted, and adopted them into law by incorporation by reference, as Sarah mentioned earlier. So for example, and I did not choose this example, the DC Circuit Court of Appeal did, 46 section CFR 39.2009 says you can power your barge's liquid overfill protection system by hooking up to an off-barge facility so long as your explosion-proof plug conforms to Article 406.9 of something called NFPA 70. And NFPA 70 is a copyrighted standard owned by the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA. But 46 CFR 39-2009 doesn't exact, actually say expressly what Article 406.9 of NFPA 70 mandates. You have to go to the NFPA for that, and they want your money so they can continue to afford to convene conferences where experts convene and debate the merits of the various possible features of explosion-proof plugs for liquid overfill protection systems. <laughs> And that's not an inherently bad thing, right? I mean, we want incentives for experts to do this work and keep us all from buying shoddy explosive proof plugs for the various liquid overfill protection systems we use in our various barges. But where legal AI systems and the data they draw from are concerned, I don't, I don't think it requires either tremendous expertise or tremendous imagination to see the implications if the courts say these copyrights are valid and sufficient to prevent others from publishing or even copying uh, these standards. I also don't think it's controversial to posit that the advice one can get from, say, an AI-powered expert compliance system uh, is going to be much better if it can actually quote you the standard your explosion-proof plug must meet and, uh, compared to advice from a system that avoids copyright by providing instead a summary of the standard or, or tells you to go look up the standard yourself or helpfully offers you a link where you can buy NFPA for the low, low price of $145.50. So the defendants in these cases, the folks publishing these standards incorporated by reference into the black letter law, are once again Carl Malamud's publicresource.org on the left, uh, but also a for-profit creator of compliance software called Upcodes. That's part of their website on the, on the right of my slide. Right now, I'll just point out, of course, that PRO is a nonprofit entity, while Upcodes is a for-profit business, because we'll see in a minute that distinction might not be trivial. And the reason that it's not completely trivial is because of the fair use factors just three years and three slides ago, the Supreme Court said, hey, it would be great if we could avoid questions of copyright fair use when it comes to folks who want to talk about the law, at least. Yet each of these cases involving standards incorporated by reference has pretty much completely devolved, at least for now, into a fight about fair use. On the slide, you see the four fair use factors articulated by Congress in the US Code. You also see some shameless promotion for our website on the right. I was going to call it a shameless plug for our website, but given all my talk about explosion plugs previously, I didn't want to confuse anybody, so we'll go with, we'll go with uh, shameless promotion. Now I could do an entire, uh, an, another entire session about the evolution of the fair use doctrine in the Supreme Court over the last three decades, and Tim may very well ask me to do that for a just a CLE seminar at some point, but since this is just one part of my part of this session, suffice it to say that fair use pretty much comes down to money. Is the infringer making money and is the copyright holder losing money? Of course, it's a little more complicated than that, but perhaps only just a little more complicated. But right there, you can see why I implied just a minute ago that there could be different outcomes when PRO publishes copyrighted material standards, excuse me, publishes copyrighted standards as part of its mission to inform the public. Uh, versus when uh, a for-profit company publishes those same standards in advance of its mission of getting their investors a solid return on their venture capital. So please here insert the very important homily about how we in the nonprofit education sector might have an added responsibility here to advance the state of the art if that sort of split of outcome is in fact what happens. But personally, I think, uh, and I was happy to learn yesterday that other people think that AI's use of copyrighted materials as inputs to formulate its own outputs is going to come down to what's called transformative use. 
And that's a concept that the Supreme Court really introduced to the world for the very first time in 1994 in a case called Campbell v. Acuff Rose Music. Uh, the Campbell being Luther Campbell from the infamous rap group Two Live Crew, infamous at least in my house growing up anyway. Uh, and the uh, fair use in question being Two Live Crew's parody of the Roy Orbison song, Oh Pretty Woman. And by the way, if I ever do that full session on fair use, I can guarantee I'll be playing that bass line over and over and over again before the session starts and calling it, calling it fair use. Uh, anyway, what's happened in the three decades since the Campbell case is that courts have come up with a few different ways to integrate, uh, to, uh, integrate whether a use is transformative into their analysis of the, of the first factor regarding the purpose and character of the allegedly infringing use. Basically, where the law is now, as best I can tell, is the more transformative the use, the less the distinction between commercial and nonprofit is going to matter as a general rule. Again, I'm going fast and I'm arguably oversimplifying, but I think that's what's going to happen with these questions when they come to generative AI. There are some very recently, recently filed cases regarding image generating AI in particular that haven't really gotten very far but may ultimately decide this very issue of whether feeding copyrighted stuff into a generative AI is as a matter of law sufficiently transformative to justify ignoring valid copyrights in that stuff. And I wouldn't have thought that was a particularly close question until the Supreme Court did what it did about a month ago in a case involving Andy Warhol's work when it reversed a trend that seemed to be expanding fair use. And I don't really think at the end of the day that decision changes the likely outcome of any of the litigation around AI and copyright that actually exists now or might potentially exist in the near future. But you know, it may well change the risk calculus for all the parties involved in, those, uh, in that litigation or potential parties that could be involved in that kind of litigation and, and thus alter their conduct in ways that are both you know, predictable and, and not predictable. So this is the last case I want to talk about, Thomson Reuters v. Ross Intelligence. TR is, of course, uh, the parent company of Westlaw. Probably everybody in this room knows that. Uh, now, way back in 2017, they noticed unusual usage patterns by a licensee called Legalese, who is basically like a litigation support company. TR sued Legalese for violating the terms of that contract and then quickly realized uh, that the company was doing what it was doing because it was handing over tons of case law to its own client, Ross, uh, which I assume most of you know is a Canadian company that has visions of revolutionizing legal research uh, using AI, very similar to what our keynote speaker and his company are, are doing uh, case law. Well, TR settled that first lawsuit with Legalese uh, and then it sued Ross alleging, among other things, that Ross's use of Westlaw's case law violated West copyright in the key number system and its head notes, etc. In due course, Ross answered and counterclaimed, as one does. Uh, those counterclaims include allegations that TR's refusal to license just the case law without access to Westlaw's software platform itself, or what Ross calls West search technology, violates sections one and two of the Sherman Antitrust Act. West moved to dismiss those counterclaims, but the court denied that motion, which means that Ross gets to continue to make its antitrust claims, uh, at least for now. Here's a summary of some of the language from the court's denial of TR's motion to dismiss in April 2022. The citation is at the top of the slide to that order for the truly deranged among you who want to read it. And the citations in the bullets are contained in the court's order itself, lest anyone accuse me of doing the slightest bit of my own analysis on the merits here. Uh, you can read the slide if you like, and I'm not now, nor have I ever been an antitrust lawyer, but basically Ross's relevant allegations that the court identified are that TR doesn't separately license its case law from its search tools or its software, which most of us in this room know is true, uh, but that's uh, but the, because of its dominant market position that, that TR has in Westlaw, that TR needs to do that for antitrust purposes because Ross alleges the market for just the case law is distinct from the market for the whole enchilada. Ross also alleges that TR's take it or leave it Westlaw user contracts don't allow licensees to only use what they want, and then TR takes advantage of the existence of the copyrighted headnotes and the key number system, etc., to sue anybody that tries to republish or otherwise creatively use just the case law. Okay, so in that April 2022 order denying TR's motion to dismiss, the court found that the facts Ross pled uh, do support theories of liability under sections one and two of the Sherman Antitrust Act because they allege an illegal tying of the case law database itself 
to West Search Tools and the Westlaw Research Platform. Specific to the Section 1 claim, Ross successfully pled that bundling everything together in what it characterizes as contracts of adhesion reinforced Westlaw's dominant market position in case law by denying potential competitors entry into the market for legal search. In other words, Westlaw binds its copyrighted materials and proprietary technologies so closely to the black letter law, according to Ross, that West uh, can then enforce ownership rights over that law in a way that's anti-competitive and forecloses competition. And I hope that at least some of you are starting to think, gee, I wonder if Westlaw and LexisNexis having their own AI-powered tools doesn't actually strengthen Ross's case insofar as Clearly, a company with a dominant market position on complete and comprehensive case law is going to have an advantage that the law could deem any competitive when building tech-forward legal research tools. And I feel like maybe I've heard Ed Walters or Tim Stanley or something like that <laughs> say that before, right? So anyway, just last week, on the 5th of June, Ross filed uh, this list of its experts. The name at the bottom there is the same Peter Martin as a gentleman in this photo. Uh, of course, he's our co-founder at LII, and I'll just say that having been Peter's student 15 years ago and having spent time in his orbit uh, for much of the last decade, I would not want to be on the other side of the V from him uh, on this stuff. Uh, that would not be enjoyable. Um, I will end my time by noting that the other guy in this picture, Tom Bruce, Many of you know him. He's seated in the third row on the end. Uh, Tom was fond of saying, in a way that I assure you was not meant to be a compliment, that he could always tell who the lawyer was in any meeting because the lawyer would be the one asking, who owns it? Uh, I hope you'll see that at least when it comes to AI training data, that question has you know, become an important one. So thank you very much. I'll take questions at the end, or I'll talk your ear off about this stuff at lunch if you want, or whatever. But uh, now, Tim. Just press the button. Yeah, it's the arrow on the uh, on the keyboard. All right. Good. Run through here. All right. All right. So I'm just going to run through a few things. Um, but first of all, no matter what you do. You don't want to be this guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll end up in a slideshow. It's, yeah, it's not going to be good. Um, so regardless about uh, AI or anything else, you got to check your work. It's ridiculous. Uh, but anyways, that's, that's what happens. Um, I want to run through a few things. I'm really just going to run through the first two here uh, a bit. First, I just want to talk about AI really quickly in general and compare it to spell checking and citation checking. Because a lot of people say, should we use it, not use it? Uh, the basic gist is, it's going to be there, you're going to end up using it, it's going to become like a spell checker. It's, it's done. You don't even need to think uh, more than a second on that. So, whatever arguments you have, you know, people aren't going to learn how to write, you know, people don't know how to spell, okay? It, it's just the way it's going to be. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, data availability and accuracy sort of tying in to some of the stuff that Sarah was mentioning. Copyright and privacy stuff, if I need to fill two or three minutes. Otherwise not. All right. Um, first, spell check. Everybody uses spell check, right? People probably don't know how to spell. We use Google. And I don't know. How, you know, else does like an automated spell check. Grammarly. It, Grammarly. Yeah. It's coming up, but you can use the search engine. You see the slides? No, it's, <laughs> good. it's really good, right? And it's AI, so, um, so you know it's good. Um, but everybody uses spell check, right? It's just the way it is. Um, so one of the things I was, you know, started doing the, the slides. I looked up and. These are the guys who sort of started spell checking stuff. And I know these guys. This is uh, Lisa Ernest and uh, Ralph Gorin. Uh, uh, Les was uh, a guy at uh, computer uh, uh, privacy for his uh, computer professionals for social responsibility that I worked with in Palo Alto. And I did some stuff with ACLU with him. A very hippy guy. He rides bikes like Tom, very into biking. And Ralph was my first computer science professor. But they did spell check, and they were both in the uh, AI group, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the sales group with. Uh, with the folks there. Um, this is what uh, Ralph looked like when I hit him. <laughs> um, and then here you also have like specialized spell checks. So like here are legal ones, right, that you might pay a little extra. Like this one is like, all right, so it's like $99 to like $1,100, $1, which is the Thompson version of it. And here's uh, another one. But you can always buy additional spell checks that you might use for particular things, as you will do with AI. You'll might get specific ones that are for law, right? You get the general ones, and all of a sudden you'll get the different specific ones. Um, and then Grammarly. 
is, is the one that I use, and that's the best one. So uh, it uses AI. It's, I can't spell because of Grammarly, uh, but or use Grammar because Grammarly I don't spell or Grammar. Uh, but anyways, you can use these tools, and, and it's, it is they're great. Um, same thing with like Keysight and Shepardization. I know everybody, a lot of people have other ones. Um, you know, everybody uses these. You could say, well, because we have key site shepherdization, people don't really go read the cases, find the citations, or read the previous cases. It's you know BS because it saves them time. And they just aren't learning as fast, right? Well, that's true. But on the other hand, it, it's a good tool. And I think eventually AI will start doing this stuff better. I know people are using it right now. But you, you know, normally AI is good at summarizing cases uh, if you give it the full uh, context of the case. And if you can take the summarizations, you can turn it into like different, you know, like West Keynotes or different issues, get the issues defined up front. Then you could go from issue to issue and do a better job on your uh, uh, citators on this stuff rather than, you know, is this case overruled by this case? Well, what part? But, you know, diversity of jurisdiction? No, that's the same as the other one. It's like 50 issues in every case, right? And there's one that really matters. Um, but anyway, so this, this stuff will be tied in with AI, but again, something that's good. And then I just want to quickly run through the AI tools that are out there. Um, in terms of stuff, and sort of what we see at Justia. Now, Justia, we have like lots of programmers. We got 120 people. I think like 80 are tech and 50 are programmers right now. And they're all working on stuff. We just got to figure out how we can do it cheap and free, not charge money. But it's always hard. You have to pay money. Uh, but you got OpenAI, uh, and they're sort of the ones with ChatGPT. Everybody uses them. There's Google, which is coming out. So if you watched the Google I/O conference, you would have thought there was an AI company. You would have forgot that they did search. Um, and these guys are pissed. So uh, the Google folks did all the transformer stuff that OpenAI took, and they go, I think it's got a lot of the credit for our work. And Google's good, and those guys are good. And they, I know they were fighting with different groups that they combined, whatever, and they're all focused on it. But what you see from Google right now with BARD, uh, it's the, like the zoom of AI right now, not the best. Uh, but this could get better and better. Uh, it, it, it'll just keep going. It, it, Google's really good at knowing what information is good, what information is correct. It's current, right, Under, unlike the uh, current common crawl uh, stuff that uh, OpenAI has. So I would look a lot of stuff for Google to just get better and better. I just think, at the end of the day, I think they will end up winning and being the best. That's just my overall take. Um, you know, Anthropic has stuff. This is pretty good, too. You can get that hosted uh, on Amazon, so the, the Amazon tie-in on that. And then this is the most interesting one of all of them, which is the, the llama stuff from uh, Meta or Facebook. I, call them. I think that Facebook has just decided, you know, we're trying to do our, you know, Meta world, virtual reality, second life, second whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and they, they, you know, getting beat up for that. But I think they just sort of decided, well, we'll do this AI stuff. We'll just give away for free. We're going to do everything. So they put up the models. They put up all the uh, weights. And they said, go use it. All researchers go use it. Now, commercially, you probably have to do something, but everybody's just, everybody's just using this right now. Everybody. I mean, and you can run this stuff, some of these models, on your laptop. And they're training them. There's different ways of training them, but I'll touch on that in a second. But so people have taken this, right? Alpaca and stuff at Stanford. They, they took it down because it was writing some crazy answers that were being associated with Stanford, which they got their own issues there. Um, but they, they, you still get the code, and you can download it. It's on GitHub still. You can download it and run it, and it runs fine. And you know, Is it as good as ChatGPT 3.5, as they said? No, I don't know. Probably not. But it, it, it does a lot of stuff. This is Open Llama. This is, they're still training this right now, but this is coming out. Uh, and then Orca. This is the one to watch. This is the one from Microsoft folks. They have a relationship with OpenAI, but then their developers went out and they did the stuff with the, the Llama uh, stuff, and this one's really good. Uh, now, it hasn't been fully released yet, but the paper stuff they put out and all the other things, and they are going to release the, the code and, the, and all the weights and things like that. So this is just using the 13 billion one, so this is something you can run on uh, different uh, you know, uh, fields, whatever you call it. Uh, this is something that you could run on your uh, laptop. Uh, but here's the key stuff here. So most of these things are just imitation, just uh, prompt response peers, right? They're doing the training stuff, they all pack and stuff. They just do this, it's A, B, A, B, A, B. The key thing with these guys is that when they do, they do the different prompts and responses, is they ask for explanations as to how you got to the, the, the reasoning and your decision. So the responses coming back are a lot, lot better, so they feed it back in, it's actually giving it more context in terms of how, in terms of how they actually look for answers. Which is something you should also do on your prompts. I'll touch on that in a second for uh, ChatGPT. If if you use ChatGPT for, for law, you might want to use case text or something else. I mean, I don't 
ChatGPT by itself is, you know, you don't want to be a, a photo and a slide. Um, but, th but this one right here for the work of part is really good. So this is the one I think a lot of people are looking at when it comes, when it gets released, that, that people will be, be checking out and seeing if they could use it. All these things decrease the price like well over a thousandfold. I mean, this is going to, the, the price differential is huge. And if you get as good as Chat GP3 3.5 right now for one thousandth of the price, like ten thousandths, you know, you know eventually you're going to get figure out uh, GPT-4. Um, I think between that and Google, once they get everything going, getting super aggressive, and when they get aggressive, they will get aggressive with pricing, right? You might call it predatory pricing, maybe, <laughs> right? If you're my antitrust, right? Uh, but they're going to flatten all the pricing. So expect all the pricing to come down, expect everything to get a lot better, and everyone's going to end up using it. So a year from now, it's going to, you know, you'll still be talking about AI, but it's, things are just going to be a lot, lot better. It's, I mean, it's going to be like night and day. Um, then you've got sort of some legal specialists. <coughs> you've got case text, which uh, you know, Pablo's here talking about. Uh, Thompson, which is sort of coming out with their stuff. They've got really good, uh, I don't know, you know, I worked at Thompson for two years. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and the, uh, and, uh, but their programmers are good. Uh, so uh, you know, Peter Jackson, not the movie guy. Years ago. But he was, that guy was smart. He, all he did was program and shoot stuff with his shotgun. It was just <laughs> amazing. Um, so that, you know, that, that was, these guys are good. They'll figure it out. Um, or, you know, they'll purchase case decks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you read the blogosphere, I mean, you believe everything you read. Um, and then there's Lexus, um, which, let's see, they, I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, and the VLAX has stuff. VLAX fast case, right? They, they combine them. But those guys are good. So they've got some good stuff going on, too. Um, they've been mostly on more on the international side, but now with a fast case, they'll be tying in. They've done some stuff with them on Canadian things in the past. Uh, so they're allowed, again, these are the legal specialty ones. You like your legal specialty dictionaries, right? You might have to pay more for it. But you know, it, it, it's something they'll, they'll be coming out. It's, anyways, everything's going to get better and cheaper, and I would just keep watching that. You know, eventually, uh, you know, if OpenAI changes their prices and decreases enough, uh, Case Text will be giving you guys all free trials again, just like, you know, like the old days, like last year. Um, so data availability and the accuracy. So let me run through this part. So this is a, a separate thing. This is more of the Sarah part. The first thing I just wanted to say, just work, just use generative AI. It's not, you don't have a choice. Alright, U.S. law databases. Um, so here, this is just a mess. I, I thought, when did I start uh, trying to copy anything Tom did at Fine Law? It was like 1995 or something like that. Uh, and we were just trying to aggregate stuff. And I thought by, I remember writing down, I said, you know, by 2023, this stuff's going to be good. And we're going to have everything marked up and great. And we were, I'm not going to say we're as bad as we were in 1995, but not much better. I mean, it's, it's not good at all. It's just a disaster. Um, so here's uh, Carl. We all sort of you know, know Carl from stuff. He's a terrorist guy. Um, the, uh, and and, and the, uh, the big thing on the Supreme Court stuff was, you know, um, this is on the Georgia Annotated Codes. And I also want to make a couple points of this because I'm also on the board at publicresource.org for a long time. And I'm general counsel, although I don't really make any decisions. It's just so Carl can rant to somebody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, the, uh, you know, this thing, you know, I, the, the big thing here was uh, a couple things. One, Lexus was sort of had, they had the database, right? And we put it up on Justia because I could put it up, just do what I do. But Fastcase went through and tried to license it. And Lexus refused to license to them at any price. So, then what did Fastcase have to do? They had to go write the headings, which are not part of the law, for every single code section. Right? It's crazy. And again, there were, at no price would Lexus license this stuff out. So, you know, Ed tells the story to Carl, and then next thing you know, Carl's downloading it and sending it to every legislature and all the press their, their own code on a peanut-shaped uh, uh, USB drive, mm -hmm. so they can have their own copy, and he put it up. And he kept pushing him and pushing them, and you know, he used to be on Twitter. He's not on Twitter anymore. Who is? Uh, but uh, now he's on Amazon. You can find him. Um, but he did that, and then of course he got sued, uh, and they called him a terrorist. And then the, the case won. In the case won. It, w it was a not normal split. The five younger people on the court 
said, yeah, this, this should be available. You should have a copyright on this stuff. And the four older folks, including Breyer, who I personally met at a Thompson offsite, <laughs> so I kind of knew we were going to get his vote, uh, said, no, this, they, they, they should have the copyright on it, on the stuff. So that, that was what sort of drove it. The, the fact that the annotations were included, they did not sell it without the annotations in any way. And they also had like the first, in the, the beginning part of the text, it said, ignore these annotations at your peril. Uh, so we couldn't ignore them. So we just, you know, Carl, I said, I can't figure out what's the code and what's the annotation. We put the whole thing. And uh, he said, OK. And then we get sued, and, and there we are. They move up. This is a big one uh, uh, for everybody. Um, just other things, court decisions. A lot, of, a lot of the different states, this is from the Library of Congress, but just sort of pointing stuff out. You know, some states publish their official ones, other ones allow West to do it. And if West does it, start triple king. Because they aren't going to, you're not going to, you know, unless you want to be Ross and just try to see what happens. Um, it's, you know, and that's what happened. That's what, you know, fast case, all the folks say it's a triple key. And you get the slip opinions. You know, same thing. I mean, we're the, the official Ninth Circuit opinions. You get, get, it's just a collection of slip opinions. They should just say they're the official ones and call it that. Everybody should put up the official opinions themselves. But some states in particular, you have to go to West. Um, this is one where West got the legislative histories for the GAO. You know, it was a few years ago, but they, they had exclusive access to stuff from government work, and they bragged about it. Look at all the work these uh, folks did on it, and you can pay us money for it. And then, of course, Carl went to boing boing with it, and they got picked up by the bloggers here. Uh, this is back to the stuff with the incorporated by reference. The big stuff here is, you know, you had all these codes. Now they're they're trying to put the codes up now. They're, they've changed the rules a bit that there has to be some access to these uh, uh, codes, these private uh, sort of nonprofit private codes where the nonprofit heads make like a million a year. I, I'm not going to go through all this stuff. Don't let Carl do that. Uh, but the um, they, they're starting to put those up. But at the time we, you know, Carl started this stuff, they were not putting those up. And this included health and safety items that had criminal penalties. So you couldn't. You had to do something that involved physical safety of human beings, where you might go to jail if you don't uh, you know, follow the rules, and you couldn't read it. You know, if you had 1200 bucks, but you know, who has that? And this is like building contractors. I mean, you're talking the, the building industry for, for the most part for a lot of this stuff. It's like the California building code, not even the regs, you couldn't read. I mean, they give you the California code on the site, but it was missing the whole building code. I mean, you, you had the illusion that you're looking at the, Cal, the full California code. So lots of things like this. So this is, there's a lot of different, there's litigation going on with this still. And not just the United States. This is like worldwide litigation. You're getting sued everywhere. Uh, but, you know, okay. Uh, and then I want to point a little bit out about some of the uh, uh, sort of additional uh, sort of content that's uh, out there. Here's like uh, ALI, mm -hmm. um, American Law Institute, nonprofit. But if you want to read their stuff, West Lexus or, uh, uh, you know, I guess the Heinel Mine does it. So things like that. As far as other secondary sources, Thompson has a lot of good stuff. So if you ask me who will probably win this in the legal sphere, given that for high-end litigation, cost does not seem to be the big issue for things, I think Thompson's in really good shape. Their programmers are really, really good. Uh, they might buy case decks. You know, and uh, they uh, also have incredible amounts of content. Uh, and it's, I don't like to say it, but they're, they're, they're set up for this uh, pretty well once they start releasing stuff. Uh, Lexus, I don't know, leave it there. Um, <laughs> so random things, I'll quickly go through codes and legislative intent because I'm almost out of time here. Uh, here's Carl again on the codes. I just wanted to point a couple things out here that codes are not laws. Codes are just legislative intent documents. So here I asked uh, ChatGPT, same-sex marriage uh, legal in Mississippi. It said, uh, this first time it said no. But it's random, right? It's, this is, it, you could go through the API and get less random stuff, but this time it said no, and uh, I did it again and it said yes. <laughs> it depends. No, it's it's just, but, and the first one even said, even though there was a Supreme Court case, that they, they had changed their laws or something. Um, here's the key thing if you're using ChatGPT in particular. You've got to add some more context to your, your, your prompt, all right? Just say, so here, if I say same sex, is, is no, I took out the is. I think I, well, I cut it off. Like, is same-sex marriage legal in Mississippi? And please explain your steps you took to, uh, to get your answer so I can see your legal reasoning. I'm pretty sure this is probably similar to some of the prompts that Case Texas is doing to get better answers from this stuff. 
But it, and it's the same stuff that Orca was doing on, on in terms of getting better stuff for their training model uh, for the Llama stuff when they were training it on uh, Chat GPT uh, 3.5 and, and 4 as well. Just to add this additional context, you always do better. If you force it to go through and try to explain things, it starts looking for different sets of autocomplete. And the autocompletes it starts looking at tends to be better than just the automated one. And if you just ask them something quick, something back, it starts producing gibberish. But if you force it to go stuff, it has to look at different places to find better information. It has to organize it, and the answer will tend to be better. Just because more explanation tends to lead to better answers. Not always, but most of the time. So there's still ways to use ChatGPT itself directly, but you've got to do the extra work on this. Um, if you use the API, you can reduce the you know, sort of variability and things like that. And one of the reasons you get this bad answer, of course, is this is the Mississippi code. And here it is, right? It's still this way, right? That marriage, man and woman, and we're not looking at, you know, if you've got same gender marriages outside, we're not going to recognize them in Mississippi. That's the law in the books. Unfortunately, if you go and you look at the Mississippi code on the Mississippi site, they point it, you know, put you over here, uh, as people in Mississippi do. They don't give the annotations or anything. It's hosted by Lexis. So you've got a whole set of people in Mississippi who still believe this is the law in Mississippi. Because if it wasn't the law, they would have changed it. And they haven't changed the law. So they, don't, they, don't, they know there was a Supreme Court decision. They go, well, didn't apply to Mississippi or the way they changed it. That's how people think everyday people, right? Some lawyers and some chat GPT responses, right? Um, and so I want to cut one, one last thing on this. I don't know, uh, uh, this is a map of the United States of America. And I don't know if you guys are history buffs, but there was not too many years ago that uh, women actually had the right uh, to choose to decide whether they get abortion or not. It's not, not today. No. But, but if you go back in history, like a couple of years, uh, that's the way it used to be. Um, and these are the states that actually either had laws on the books that uh, did not, that, that had abortion being illegal, or they had trigger laws that said if abortion is made, the, there's overturning of Roe v. Wade, it would automatically be made, uh, um, you know, automatically be not allowed in the United States. Um, and so, of course, Dodd's decision came out. But that Dodd's decision didn't just impact the abortion stuff. It's a huge issue for the country. I don't deny that part. Um, but you have a lot of states right now, and they've said, this is their thinking. Shit, man, we're just going to pass laws all over the place, do what we want, and we'll just wait for the Supreme Court to change the decision. And so you're getting a lot more laws passed, even though they know they're unconstitutional. And sometimes they'll make them trigger laws. They say, if this changes, this happens. Sometimes they won't. They'll just pass the laws, depending on how many Republicans are in the legislature. Um, but it, this is just going on all over the place. And so this particular decision, what it did is it greatly encouraged legislatures and state governments to start changing their laws to stuff that's unconstitutional, just to see what happens, right? You know, 7 to 2 today might be... Two to seven the other way? I don't know. It can happen, right? I mean, a lot of stuff there. All right, last couple things. Court filings you can go through. If you put all this stuff up, that's fine. But you got to realize court filings has a bunch of gibberish in it. There are lawyers' <laughs> crappy arguments. And not just lawyers do it. There are a lot of pro se stuff. I don't know if you go in there. So the idea that you put Pacer in there and autocomplete off that crap, I don't know. I don't know if I do it. Here's an example one that we had <laughs> up last night. And, uh, this one, uh, actually, he was suing Google. They, it was something about a social security number. I had to black it out because it says right here, plain social security number is this. No privacy protections at all in the courts. Uh, a separate issue. But um, this is just. Someone's got to pay. Um, <laughs> Google, I got a lot of money. And so I mean, you can read through it. But this is, the type, this is just one pro se thing. But even just non pro se stuff, you've got like lawyers who don't know how to write briefs, right? You've got like real. <laughs> 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 You won't believe the crap that they file. I mean, it's just horrible. It's America's mirror. <laughs> um, all right, the last couple things. I already mentioned this stuff. The secondary materials. That, that stuff's going on uh, with West and stuff like that. I, I will, I'll sort of stop right here. Um, but it's, there, there's a lot of stuff. I just say everyone should use it. It's going to get a lot, lot cheaper. The U.S. system's a mess in terms of getting raw materials. I mean, I'm going to tell you what regulations is like. I'm trying to grab that stuff. But it's everything is what it is. But... It's going to happen, and people will probably end up using it a lot of times and stuff. So with that, let me uh, hand over to Craig to maybe take over to Sarah to take over if you guys can do questions sure. and answer stuff. Don't go too far.
we can start a little bit late. I think we're pretty much technically at the end of the session. Uh, if there are any questions, especially from the from the Zoom world, who's monitoring that? Uh, we got long breaks. Take a few questions. Okay, sure. <coughs> if there are any questions for any of us, Let's see, we're that comprehensive and thorough. It's that early in the morning. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, everybody.